said, I'm not, I'm new to public speaking, but I do love people with low standards, so <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> so the title of my message is, is I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going controversial, and uh, Mr., uh, Pastor Jordan says to uh, keep it down the middle if you're not used to this, and so I have the basic salvation message that you're all used to here and I'm sure so um, that's what we're going to do my mess my title of my message is why rightly divide the word of truth uh, based off of second Timothy 2 15 and uh, so I'll open with a word of prayer first okay so Heavenly Father we thank you for this time we have together and we thank you for your word to us and um, the clarity that you give us through rightly right division and we just thank you for salvation that we have through the cross in Jesus name amen, amen. okay so uh, we as grace believers understand the significance of second Timothy 215 we might as well just go there 215. 215. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, most important about rightly dividing is that we understand where we fit in and where our salvation comes from. We can't just force ourselves anywhere in the Bible and, and expect to be in the will of God. So I'm going to use the chart that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Um, I have a, something about the chart. We use it for clarity. Um, just like it, it's laid out for the people on the Internet that don't know that this chart is laid out to mirror the way your Bible is laid out. It starts with a beginning, which would be the Genesis, uh, Genesis period and as time goes on, it's working its way to an end. And that's rightly dividing as a, acknowledging the, uh, the uh, dis dispensational changes that happen over time. God doesn't change, but his dealings with sinful man does over time. Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, Paul breaks down our Bible in uh, three distinct time zones. Um, as it says here, time passed, but now, right here, and ages to come. And uh, you could say, in, in other words, past, present, future. And that is part of the clarity that we get from rightly dividing. Uh, you notice, as you're reading your Bible, you'll, you'll come across important phrases that have to deal with time. Uh, time signatures, I call it. Or indicators. Uh, you hear you're in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Time. Human history. Um, these last days, you'll read uh, the world to come, whereof we speak. Those are all indicators of of time. And so when we use a chart set up the same way as the Bible, it, it becomes way more clear what's going on. Uh, you'll hear read in the latter times, uh, time was fulfilled, etc. So, the, uh, the chart shows distinctions between the rise of the Jew, right here. This is where things begin. We sh back here, we're, we're mankind. There's just one class of people. Um, Genesis chapter uh, 10, where man just decides at the Tower of Babel, we're parking it right here. We're not going to scatter which is what God told them to do in uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. He told Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That means to reproduce people. So they park it right there. They don't, they, that's rebellion. So then, so God uh, in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 21, he's talking about this time period right here where he gives up man. You guys just gonna just do what you're gonna do, and then very next chapter in chapter 11, you see him going to Abraham, calls up Abraham. That's where 
that's where we get the Jew and the Gentile split right there. That's quite a uh, distinction in time. Uh, and then as time goes on, you'll see the fall of the Jew, a temporary fall, not a permanent. This is where we are as grace believers. We're not, uh, we're not a replacement theology. This is a temporary um, dispensation that's going to end with the rapture of the church. And then this will all just flow together. Um, so not teaching replacement theology at all. Uh, was in Romans chapter 11, he talks about what they're receiving on them will be from, as life from the dead. They're set aside, and then they'll be back in the ages to come. So we, we use this for clarity. Uh, so dispensational Bible study is separating truth from truth. What's true in one age is true, but, it doesn't, but things change, and that's true too. So what do you do with that? You'd have to rightly divide it in order to, for it to make any sense. So what is a dispensation? A dispensation is a particular set of instructions given by God at a certain time in human history for man's obedience. Dispensational Bible study is merely studying your Bible on a timeline, recognizing the distinct changes that God placed in his Bible. Uh, the word dispensation, Paul uses four times in his epistles. And if you're using a King James Bible, you'll see them. Uh, but if you're not, you won't see them at all. Um, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1. Ephesians 3, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Jesus Christ. Uh, is this my verse? Verse 2. Or 3. Oh, so maybe it's 3. Third. Oh, maybe. I'm, not, I'm in the wrong word. It's Ephesians 3. I heard that. Ephesians 3 says, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you, word, if you don't have a King James Bible, you haven't heard, because the word dispensation is not in a modern Bible. We can teach salvation out of a modern Bible. There's enough information in there to, that, to share with someone to, that they could get saved out of a modern Bible. But to teach dispensational Bible study when the word is not there, it's almost impossible. So that's a travesty. All right. So this morning, I'm going to start in the but now. I had thought about starting over here and working over there, but I, if, if I don't have enough time, I want to at least cover salvation and how we achieve it, how we attain it as believers today. Uh, okay, so the he bring Paul brings in an unpro everything back here is according to prophecy. Prophets spoke it, and then time goes by, it happens. Jesus came and fulfilled a whole bunch of prophecies that were spoken of since the world began way back here. And that's the program here. Say it and it happens, say it and it happens. You get to Paul, he says that. Uh, this is an unprophesied mystery or secret dispensation. A mystery and a, a mystery and secret are synonymous. It just means something that no one knew about. Just, but now is being revealed. That's what we call that. The but now, Romans sixteen twenty five. Um, I could recite that until I got up here. <laughs> okay, 1625. But now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret. It's not a big deal. Mystery, secret, they're the same thing. Since the world began. So 
but now is made manifest. So that's why we're in the but now. So these prophets back here, if you read the book of Daniel, he's always talking about the kingdom that's coming. He's come, he doesn't know anything about right here. And so Paul brings a new dispensation in that no one knew about until his time. And part of the reason we can't just plug ourselves in right here in the four Gospels at the cross is because it's, Paul doesn't come along until after that. And so we as Gentiles, we've been cut off. This is the Gentiles down here. This is the four Gospels. We're without Christ, he says in Ephesians 2. So we can't just go anywhere and say, I believe in Jesus. That's not what we're talking about here. We have access to the benefits of this, but at a certain time. Um, Romans 5, 6 Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. We're part of this group that he gave up. So, but we, we have access now. 1 Timothy 2, verse 6. 1 Timothy 2. First, First Timothy 2, 6. Who gave him, talking about Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. This is, this is where it's being testified, right here. And it's looking back to the cross. So that's, uh, we get our access in due time. Better late than never. Uh, and Paul is the due time uh, prophesier. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Fifteen eight. 8. Uh, he says, and, the la and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So, like I said earlier, we can't just plug ourselves in anywhere on this chart, which this doesn't work. Uh, okay, so the mystery, in, the mystery in general is that a Gentile has access to God by faith without going to a Jew. This is new information uh, that was kept secret. Um, Ephesians 3, 1 through 6 Ephesians 3, gosh, man, I lost. very slow, Ephesians 3, 1 through 6, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, down here, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace, like I read earlier, given to me, you, from me, given to to, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, which, as I wrote in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known. So, is that where I wanted to go? Okay. Yeah, 316. Okay, so there it is. There's more proof or driving it home that what the, his gospel is a mystery. Uh, Romans 5 2. Romans 5 2. That, uh, that, we we uh, we having access to God without a, without the help of a Jew without the aid of a Jew, that's how it was back here. We uh, even though the Gentiles were cut off, you had two 
options if you were to say, uh, I want what they want, what they have. You would have to get circumcised or you blessed the Jew. Uh, God told Abraham in uh, Genesis 17 that I'll, I'm going to make you a, a, a great nation and I'll bless them that bless you. So if a Gentile went up and blessed the Jew, then he could have access into being a Jew. Otherwise, you didn't have any access until now. Um, so uh, Ephesians 2.18 as well. Uh, verse 18 for through him we both have we both have access by one spirit unto the father and there's no more distinction between the Jew and the Gentile over here we're all just one Jew and Gentile Israel's been temporarily set aside as I said earlier um, but, but they will be back in ages to come the status of man here is you're either lost or you're saved. And it doesn't matter who we're talking about as far as ethnic or distinction like, like it was between a Jew and a Gentile. We're just talking about lost and saved people. Romans 3.9 and 3.19. Romans 3.9. nine. What then? Are we better than they, the Jew? No. And no wise... For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. The issue is not that physical characteristic anymore, that physical distinction. It's just lost or saved. As it is written in verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, referring to Israel, it saith to them who are under the law, that every man... Now, that every mouth may be stopped, meaning the Jew and the Gentile, uh, and all the world may become guilty before God. That's, this is one nation, and this is the rest of the world. So when they, through their unbelief, fall, now you can circle that and say all have sinned. This is where they intersect. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right here. You couldn't say that back here because they had a way to atone for sin. Over here, when they, when God, at the stoning of Stephen, then that's a, a, a slow falling away until they fall to the status, the level, in the eyes of God, to the level of the Gentile. So all have sinned right here. That's Dispensational Bible study. You couldn't just say that anywhere. They sinned, but they had animal sacrifices and they had the law to back them up for, to atone for that sin. You and I were cut off. We, are, we already blew it back here. So when God gets fed up with their rebellion, then we're all together one, just a big bunch of sinners. He ain't nobody's better than me, right? So, but Paul brings in unlimited atonement, which is a good thing, right? To all and upon all that believe, Romans 3.22. So, which means, if that's going to be different, uh, Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. So, if all have sinned, that means uh, that it's to all and upon all. The, over here was a limited atonement. He was only uh, dealing with his people up here. So, a Jew could be forgiven, like I said. And so, we were out of it. So now it's to all 
and upon all that believe. That's different. That's a huge, huge change. Jesus was talking, if you notice, a lot of times in his, in his uh, talking to the little flock, he says, my people, my people. My people is a, is a uh, indication of who he's talking to is the nation Israel. They are my people. Jacob is his inheritance. Context is king. You have to have, you have to use context and understand who he sta- who said it and who he say it to. If we're cut off, the my people are not us. Um, Isaiah fifty three or fifty two. Isaiah fifty two. Hey, my first rabbit trail. I don't even know where Isaiah is. There it is. Isaiah 50, I'm getting close. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I didn't even. I forgot to highlight this one. Okay, so verse 5. Now therefore what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught. They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my, my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name, and they shall know that that, that day I am he that does speak. Uh I know when he talks about my people went down four time into Egypt, so that's more specific that uh, Israel did Israel is the ones that were in Egypt. Okay, so not generally speaking, people like to say, well, that's us. That's why we can go to the Old Testament. He says, my people, I'm saved personally. He must be talking to me. Nope. Contextually, that's not correct. So, so here we are in Paul's uh, atonement, uh, Paul's unlimited atonement to all, and upon, to all and upon all that believe. Paul is, uh, uh, Paul is not part of the 12. If you go to Matthew 10, they have the list of the names of the apostles. That was my first big aha moment when somebody, first thing he told me, I, you're talking about I've been in the church my, most of my whole adult life and Church of Christ when I was a kid. You know, Not that I was awake the whole time, but when somebody pointed out to me that, okay, you live your spiritual life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the time we go to church, it's pretty much all they teach out of. Come to find out, when you read that in Matthew 10, you read all the names, who's missing? Mark and Luke. I never knew they weren't apostles. I mean, how many times if I, you know, you go to these books, you just assume that's what's going on. But when you take a closer look, it ain't so. They're Bible writers. It's not that they're bad guys or nothing. They're just not apostles. They're Bible writers. So you don't, you also don't see the Apostle Paul there. And I've had experiences as I'm going through this class and we lived in Arkansas. I found a small church like this. And that was an aha moment for the pastor because he said he was a dispensational Bible believing, you know, and he, his website showed it, but he mixed uh, things up a lot even though they had the salvation message correct. I just could never figure out how do you, anyway. But uh, when I talked to him about, you don't see Paul listed in Matthew 10 or the other books that have the list of the names of the apostles. It just blew his mind. I thought I had him, you know what I mean? But a few days later, he's like, it don't matter. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Oh, well, here we go. So that, that was all eye opening for me. Like, wow, that's how people get around this, right? So. You know, in modern Christian, they'll uh, they'll talk about Matthias was a mistake. Should not have picked him because they chose him before Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit fell. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't have fell on Matthias if he wasn't the right guy. Therefore, Paul is not supposed to be one of the twelve, and he doesn't have a problem with it. When I read. Uh, 
First Corinthians uh, was at uh, chapter 10 where he says, Last of all, he was seen of me. If, if it doesn't sound like me, he has a problem with it. He says he was seen of the 12, and last of all, he was seen of me. So, anyway, he's not one of the 12, which is a distinction that's huge. He's the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans eleven thirteen. I bring that up because my daughter was going to a Christian school. I was looking at her papers. I don't know if you knew that. She's, it, clearly, just put, Luke was the apostle of the Gentiles. Number one, he wasn't even an apostle. Number two, Paul says, 1113, For I speak to you, Gentiles, as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. Who's the apostle of the Gentiles? Let it say what it means and mean what it say. Is that right? Uh, so today, salvation is salvation today is under grace in Paul's epistles. It was revealed to him by the risen Jesus Christ. And I, I, I make note of that because so many people, I, I, I talk to people, they say, I don't read much of Paul because Jesus was here. And in my Bibles in general, that's the red letters. He said it, he was here, and he said it, that's good enough for me. That's like a mantra you hear. That's, if Jesus did it or said it, that's good enough for me. Okay, so who's talking to Paul? In Acts, 20, Acts 26, I go there instead of Acts, was it his uh, earlier account in the chapter, but, but there's Acts 26. Verse 14, this is Paul's, re, he's restating what happened on, to him earlier in the chapter on the road to Damascus. He's talking about his conversation with Jesus, who people think stopped talking after he rose to heaven. And when we were, we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, so what's God's language? The Hebrew tongue, right? Saul, Saul, why, per why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who, you, who thou persecutest. He's talking to Jesus, who most people want to say, Stop talking right here. So Paul's just dreaming this stuff up. But rise and stand on thy feet, and I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which ha thou hast seen, road to Damascus, and those things in which thou, which I will appear in thee, progressive revelation. As you read Paul's epistles, he's progressively getting re revelations from Christ. It's not all at one time. So, and it goes on to say, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. That's us down here. To whom their eyes to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance and in, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the, by faith that is in me. So the forgiveness of sins for the Gentile is right here. I can't go back here to get forgiveness of sins, contrary to popular belief. Just what it says. It's not a, you just got, it's kind of like if you're in a Christmas play, you have a part in a play, you don't just show up anywhere. You show up at a certain time. And that's what this special Bible study is. So, what must we do to be saved? I, I like to pull that out of the act. What must we do? Understand, understand your, that we're sinners, okay? So, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Tremendous verse about this. It's short, sweet, but dang. Powerful. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Adam, the first man. Genesis chapter 3. That's who he's referring to, and he'll bring that up later. Anyway, by the way, did... Does anybody know that, I just learned this, the Adam, the word Adam in Hebrew means man. Yeah, I'm a little late to the party. I didn't know that. I just thought it was Adam. 
why not Mike or John? You know? I've seen, <laughs> that makes sense when, when, when the, he, Paul goes on to say the, the first Adam, this, and the second Adam, he call, he's referring to Christ as the second Adam. Like, I, like why is he saying Adam? Man. Okay, anyway, my own aha moment. Uh, so where was I? Wherefore is my one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. So we get our sin nature from, from Adam. What, so what happened in the Garden of Eden in chapter 3 is perpetuated into everyone after them. So we're sinners because of who we're related to. That's the root. I like how your dad says that there's a root and a fruit. God's, concer- God's concerned with the root. The, you, you sin, we sin because we're sinners. So you have, we all have that sin nature that's passed on. You know, I, I came from a church that used to say the ABCs of salvation. A, admit you're a sinner. But you ask somebody, okay, so I heard you admit you're a sinner. Why are you a sinner? I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just a, it's just a mantra. You know what I mean? I admit I'm a sinner. Understand you're a sinner. So why are you a sinner? It's because you were born with a spiritual defect. But there is something you can do about it. And so death passed upon all men because of sin. God doesn't take anybody. A lot of people say, well, God took my husband, my whatever, I have a lot, a lot of people in my own family, you know, and we don't know any better. We just recite what we hear all the time. Why, why did God take him before he took me? He didn't take anybody. Sin took him. Death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Okay, so so now that's our, that's our situation, and you can't get past that. You can't get around that. A lot of people think you're a sinner because you're, you do, I do good things, so that doesn't apply to me. You come from Adam and Eve, you can't get around that. That's all there is to it. So when you understand that and you come to grace, uh, you understand, okay, what do we, what else? Okay, I'm a sinner, now what? And uh, Romans 3.25. Holy cow, it's already 10 o'clock. Romans 3.25. Talking about Jesus, we're looking back to the cross. We weren't here, but we are here looking back to the benefits of what Christ did for us. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. I'm going to go back up a, a couple of sins, a couple of verses sins. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. What's in Christ Jesus that's redemptive? whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That's a great word. Another, another modern Bible omission. But propitiation just simply means an acceptable sacrifice. It's what he wants that we don't have because Christ was not a sinner. So why wasn't he a sinner? I just wind it all the way back to the virgin birth. He did not have a, a human father which eliminated his sin nature. He's the only, If God wants sinless blood, like we just read, that we got ours from Adam, you can't do anything about that, that means we got nothing except faith that Christ's sinless blood took care of our sin debt. You can't work your way around that. You can't do anything but trust that. And when you add anything to that, it means you don't trust this fully. Uh, verse 25 uh, again, okay, so propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. And that's what we're talking about. We need to get our sins remitted. Uh, to, to declare, I say at this time, verse 26, his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of him which believe in Jesus. So to believe in Jesus here means you trust in his shed blood as full payment for your sins. Christ did that, and, he, and now we have access to that over here. So that's good news, right? That's gospel good news, right? So that's what you do about your 
Yeah, that's what we do about our sin handicap. And also, when you trust Christ as your Savior, there's some... Uh, I'll go to uh, Romans 4.25. I'm talking, I'm talking more about his blood, benefits of his shed blood. Uh, who was delivered, 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and raised, raised again for our justification. Um, Ephesians 1, 7. Gosh, I'm so slow. 1, 7. In whom we have, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace parallel verse to that is Colossians 1. I, I can't remember. Um, I noticed in the modern Bible, he took out NIV. These are Colossians, I'm sorry, uh, Ephesians 1, 7 and Colossians 1, 14 basically almost verbatim say the same thing, but in a modern Bible one of those is gone. What was that? Ephesians, Terry? Oh, Colossians. Yeah, yeah. So it's in Ephesians, so theoretically you could Someone could believe that and uh, get saved in a modern Bible. But uh, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So I was just hammering home that point. The blood of Jesus is everything. You can't, you know, you can't get your sins remitted by doing anything. We're saved unto good works, but not because of good works. So, uh, and the other, the other big question usually in Christendom is, can we lose it? Um, one thir- uh, Ephesians one thirteen. Ephesians one thirteen. In whom, here's, that's the same verse I was just reading, huh? In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's what we're talking about. In whom also after that you believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Another word that's omitted, I believe, sealed is not, you're not going to find it. And that's a, is that a great verse for eternal security or what, you know? So... And uh, so this is all a free gift. Again, the works, Romans 5.18. I tried to tell the pastor in Arkansas, I go, you go into all the right verses for, for salvation, but do you notice where you're getting your information from? It's the same. Yeah, and they, they're like, I never thought of that. I'm not trying to be I'm smarter than anybody. It's like, I, I was as ignorant as anybody else. Like, I never knew, you know. Like, but... After a while, you started noticing things, you know. So, 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of, the, of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. It's a gift. You can't pay for a gift. If you try to pay for a gift, it's no longer a gift. Um... And uh, Ephesians 2 8, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I'll stop going back to Romans 3. Verse uh, 27, 28, talking about it's free, no works. If you work for it, you're polluting the blood of Jesus. It's just faith in his blood. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, that Verse 27 is telling, is telling us that faith is the only thing we can do that isn't considered a work. Um, so, and that's significant um, because 
Jesus says some things that are completely different. They're true, absolutely true, but they're not the same. And Matthew 19, I'll just go there real quick. Now, after reading what we just read from Paul, you go back over here to Matthew, uh, chapter 19, verse 17, and uh, 16, it says, And behold, one came, and talk, and talking to Jesus, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what good things shall I do that I might have eternal life? That's what we're talking about, right? And he said unto him, Why cost me thou, thou me good? There is none good but one that is God, but if thou wilt enter into her life, have your sins forgiven, what does he say? Keep the commandments. Okay? Paul doesn't talk about that, because we're past this. He saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear fault. He's basically reciting the Mosaic law to this man. Keep the law. Okay, so, Acts 13 so Jesus is telling, the, I mean, is anybody here telling anybody to keep the Ten Commandments to, keep, to be saved? Nowadays, uh, when we get to Acts chapter 13, it's Paul who's getting his revelations from Jesus. And I can't find the chapter. Chapter 13, verse 39. <sighs> Verse 39, this is Paul speaking, okay, we're, we're, so Paul's our apostle, we're under grace, salvation is by faith alone and Christ alone, so this is going back into the book of Acts, for, verse 39, talking about Christ, it says, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Jesus was just telling this young man to keep the commandments, okay, that's not the this is an error. This is not a contradiction. This is a dispensational change. That's all it is. And with that, I will close. So my point is, that's why this is important. You come over here to the wrong part of the Bible. Oh, Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter three sixteen, I remember that. Second Peter three sixteen. Holy cow! My Bible's all mixed up. Sorry, folks. Second Peter three sixteen. Now this is Peter, one of the twelve, talking about our apostle Paul. And he says in verse sixteen, as also in his talking about Paul, epistles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, unstable, of me, I tell you, uh, rest. Notice that's W-R-E-S-T, rest, wrestle. Uh, I looked up a synonym for that word, and it's tangle. That's a good word. You tangle up. You read this Bible, as he says, you go on to say, as they, also, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Who would ever thought reading this Bible the wrong way could destroy your Christian life? But that's what he's saying. When you mix law with grace, it ain't going to work. You'll destroy your Christian life. That's what he's saying. So rest, you know, I, I think it was a kid, you know, your brother's like, come on, let's, let's mix it up. You know what I mean? We say wrestle, re rest. That's what that word is saying. You take those doctrines and put them together and you get nowhere. That's so where you can go your whole life going to church and you don't know beans. That was me anyway. But I'm not alone there. So that's it. I mean, I got a lot more, a lot more of it. <laughs> so I'll close with prayer. Thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your word and the 
again, the clarity that we get through right division. And we just thank you for who you've made us in your son. In Jesus' name, amen.